Today, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Arena back to the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Michael, welcome back to the show. Um, please, can you share your background and current activities with, with our listeners, please? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, David. Um, thrilled to be here again. Um, always enjoy and appreciate our conversations. Um, you know, I'm a social scientist, so my background is in studying networks. Um, I've been doing that for longer than I like to admit. Um, and, you know, that's both been from a research standpoint in academia. I uh, spent you know, a number of years as a visiting scientist up at MIT's Media Lab, which is where I really got engaged in uh, network analysis from a practice standpoint. Um, but I've been in the corporate world as well. Uh, so chief talent officer of General Motors, you know, I think we have one of the early, uh, you know, people analytics teams there that we launched. Uh, you know, I spent some time at AWS leading uh, their talent activities and organizational research activities. And then, you know, now I am back in academia um, as a dean of a business school you know, here in Southern California, so uh, Biola University, where we are applying a bunch of network analysis stuff in um, in our lab. So that's my background. And I think it's, it's great that you've kind of bridged that academia practitioner kind of bridge, as it were, because I think, I mean, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. Sometimes academia is publishing some fantastic white papers that maybe we could pay more attention to as practitioners. But sometimes maybe it's actually quite hard to implement. And then and then from a practitioner perspective, sometimes there's so much we can learn from from academic research, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think academia has been caught up in its own silos and business has been moving with great velocity and bridging back and forth. Um, I mean, there's such rich research, especially in this space, you know, network analysis. It's been around for years. And there is such um, rich research in, you know, from 20, 30 years ago. Um, and yet we haven't inside business has really pulled out the insights, the learnings, the knowledge uh, to project those forward from a practice based standpoint, for sure. Well, well, Michael, you referred to your time at General Motors and certainly one of the first examples that I came across of organizational network analysis being applied within an organization was the paper uh, that you published with MIT, or oh, I'm, I'm guessing around 2016, 2017, you can probably correct me on, on, on that. Um, and it, we talked a little bit about that last time you were on the, the show, which was incredibly four years ago. So all the way back in uh, sort of October, November 2020, um, which obviously was in the early stages of the pandemic. And for those that didn't listen to that episode, um, Michael and I spoke um, about the impact of remote working on collaboration, innovation, well-being and productivity. Seems that we might still be doing that to an extent as well. Um, <laughs> although a lot has changed since then, you know, you know, obviously Michael was one of the pioneers of applying organizational network um, analysis to business and people outcomes. How have you seen organizational networks evolve over over these last four years? Yeah, it's um, it's been really interesting. I, I I love this question. I love answering this question because um, the the very nature of networks are there is they are super dynamic. One of the challenges we have with networks is we tend to study them as static, um, you know, interactions, a set of static patterns. But the reality is they're very dynamic and they change. And I think what we learned through the pandemic is they can change rather rapidly. Um, you know, so you'll remember back in that, you know, that uh, particular podcast where we had, and we've had many conversations since then, you know, one of the things that happened immediately when we went um, to remote work was we lost our bridging connections. And, you know, for those of most everybody's probably familiar with this, but for those who aren't, like there are two primary types of connections um, that are really critical when we're looking at, you know, O&A. Uh, one is bonding connections, and that's like, how well are you connected locally, you know, within your local team? How cohesive is that? And it provides magic for speed and trust, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. And then bridging connections, and those are like kind of cross-departmental, uh, you know, cross-teams, cross-geographies, um, and that's that's what connects up silos to silos. And what we found was almost by 30% month over month, as soon as we all went remote, you know, especially here in the United States, we, we saw a 30% drop in those bridging connections. And and it stayed that way, um, you know, for quite some time. And, and probably when we were talking, we were still debating about, you know, could you ever innovate in a remote environment? Because um, bridging connections are really important for discovering new insights. 
but the, but our networks evolved and we as human beings you know figure out new novel ways of getting stuff done and new technologies and you know we ended up reforging many of those bridging connections even before we got back to the office and especially after we did um and what we what we saw was like this evolution of you know bridging being a problem in the early days and and you know david i only i look at the world through networks so I'll speak in absolutes, but it's only with this one dimension. Um, we started to see like this burnout energy crisis. You know, energy in a network is one of the greatest predictors of future performance. And as we as human beings were isolated, you know, relational energy wasn't flowing across the network. And we saw that in burnout and, you know, quiet quitting and a bunch of other, you know, things throughout the, like the second wave of activity. And then what happened was we started to return to office, um, which is kind of where we are today. And what ended up happening was we reforged those bridge connections. We never really lost the bonding connections when we were working remotely. Uh, but when we came back to the office, we, we sort of created new ones. And what we went into was what I sometimes affectionately call the activity avalanche. Um, we were holding back a bunch of activity that was non-priority uh, work during the pandemic and you know this remote work episode. And when we came back in the office, we reforged connections, we turned on the, you know, sort of the spigot of new activities, and we started killing ourselves from a collaborative drag. And we're still here today from a collaborative drag or a collaborative overload standpoint. Um, and we really haven't remedied that. You know, every business is different. Um, and certainly some of our clients are doing much better at this than others, but we really haven't come out of that phase where we truly have great collaborative drag, which matters, right? Because it, it shifts away from focus. Um, it, we lose concentration. Um, and, you know, there was a great study um, from Gardner that says that collaboration drag, you know, really has an overwhelming negative impact on revenue goals. Um, so, so those are all like, Sort of the that was like a rapid cycle three year um, you know journey uh, and longer now where we saw all the different aspects of network science. Yeah, great, and we're going to sort of talk a bit some aspects of that around the impact of distributed work on networks um, and and accelerated work as well. And then later we're going to look at maybe the future of talent management with, with social capital as well. So for listeners, we're going to kind of break the rest of the conversation into those two areas. Um, now, Michael, you you and Greg Pryor came and um, spoke at uh, our Insight 222 Global Executive Retreat last uh, last fall for Americans, last autumn for, for the Brits out there. Um, and you were talking about innovation um, and you're particularly looking at innovation in this kind of hybrid and, and, and dis more distributed work as well. And you showed that there are certain points in the innovation process actually where things can quite happily happen when people are working remotely. And you showed that there were other points of that innovation process where it's important to intentionally bring people together. So I, don't, I maybe wrap that into this question, you know, when we think about today's world of work, obviously there is more distributed work. Um, how is that impacting our, our networks? Yeah, I think it's, um, and, and, I, and I got to add another dimension to that uh, question, David, just to put it in context, um, you know, and that is the velocity of work has seemingly picked up. So you use the word accelerated. I think we not only live in a world of distributed work, you know, but with all the inventions around AI, you know, augmented, automated, and certainly accelerated. And that, and that, that matters um, because as we learn and cope in the network with new tools, um, you know, the, if the velocity of work picks up, then it creates new problems um, in our, our social interaction. So in short, like if I were to really just do the Cliff Notes version of your question, um, we um, we can work incredibly well uh, when we're on task uh, remotely. Heads down work is the easy way to think about this, you know, coding, um, project management, you know, analysis, um, you know, those things tend to work better when we're isolated and we're heads down. And, and actually getting back to the office has created pretty significant distractions. Um, you know, when you get back in the office um, and, you know, I've done a lot of work with the Worklytics folks. I, I love their data sets. Um, and, you know, so leveraging this across thousands, hundreds of companies, at least. Um, what we see is when you get back in the office and you have anchor days, um, and everyone's in there at the same point in time. Like that makes sense logically because you know, we're going to have all these serendipitous relationships. But if your head's down 
and you're trying to deliver and execute on something, it turns out you could be distracted as much as 40% of your time. And, and it has a huge um, you know, productivity tax associated with it. So, so we need to be very thoughtful. And you, you've heard me say this. I've said this very often. Intentionality is what matters most. And there are times where I'm in execution mode and I got to lock out distractions and, you know, staying at home on that day or working with three or four people as we're sort of iterating together really matters. And then there are other times like at the beginning or end of a life cycle of a, a project or, you know, product development life cycle, you know, you better get back in the office because you don't know what you don't know. And um, it is true that we can um, discover things remotely and we built better tools over the last four years to do that. But you, you still don't have these like serendipitous interactions. And there are times where coming together from a discovery, we know proximity helps discovery. The science says it, you know, you're um, 25% more likely to discover something if you're in proximity with people. Um, and then the other side of that is we know that you influence best eyeball to eyeball. Um, you know, we, um, we can get some social signal here. You know, I can do my hand dynamics and on the call, but like the reality is being live, full body experience, high energy, you know, we, we are able to influence better as human beings. So, you know, there are certain times where you have to be back in the, where it makes sense to be back in the office if you can. Um, and then there are other times where, you know, I, I think you can actually lock down and execute with greater velocity. Yeah, really interesting. And it, I think perhaps maybe we're still doing this a little bit too much. We're obsessing about where work gets done rather than what the work is and, and who does it, I think, you know, and, and hopefully there'll be more research being published and, and more examples from companies that, that, that help us get to maybe a, a better a better result both for productivity and for business but also for for employees as well yeah I think at the end of the day we'll be in a better state once we realize that this is a new complexity that we need to manage through and create new solutions I mean my it's an organizational design problem 101 like form follows function we're all arguing over what the right form is but we haven't gotten intentional about what the function is first and I think as we get more and more intentional about what our outcomes are, what we're trying to drive, then we can start thinking about the optimizing the configurations of work. And I think we're sort of middle stage. Some companies have figured this out. Um, you know, and, and here's the complexity of this. And I think, you know, I feel for leaders. You know, it's easy, it's easy for us to say leaders are mandating get back in the office. But it, frankly, this is one more very complex variable that needs to be managed. And, you know, a simple solution to come back in on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday is this easy. But the reality is we are all in different work states all the time. And when you come back in the office, as opposed to when I come back in the office or our teams, uh, matters differently depending on where we are in sort of the stage of work. It's also, I think, maybe with the, with the the more dis distributed teams, more velocity, it's probably more complexity as well, I think, isn't there? I mean, and you put all those three things together and it makes it a very hard situation to manage. I think we are not talking enough about the velocity of work right now um, and, and the impact that AI is having on that. It used to be, you know, you've heard me say, you know, a couple of times heads down, it used to be that you could lock into a sprint mode and go heads down for three weeks or even three days. But the reality is things are changing so quickly around us that if you do that, you know, the speeding bullet train has just zipped by you. And um, you're not, you know, if you're building a product in particular um, and you're not staying abreast of the new models being released. And you know, so so it's much even even some of our old agile methods um, we're, be, we're beginning to see are um, being being at least stressed, if not breaking down. Um, and I think I, you know, I, for our field, I love this. Like we get to invent new ways of working, and you know, it will be we'll all be better for it at the end of the day. But between here and there, there's going to be a lot of stress and anxiety because we we're still trying to figure some of this stuff out. For for those that are listening, um, Michael does publish publish a lot of research. Um, you could usually he'll usually do it via his LinkedIn, even if it's published elsewhere. So I definitely recommend those. Uh, those of you listening that are interested in this to, to follow Michael on LinkedIn. Um, and leading to your research, Michael, you, you've conducted research this year 
on determining the I ideal team size. Um, I'd love, love if you could share more about the research and some of the key findings um, for, to our listeners. Yeah, so this is always a fun conversation because you know we, we love to get into conversations about like what's the perfect team size and you know what you know we can talk about this in all kinds of ways and you know many of your listeners have you know done analysis on team size and ideal spans and um, what are the what are the number of proper layers we should have in an organization and you know I'm, I'm going to be here to disappoint everybody uh, in saying that the real answer is it depends. Um, form follows function once again. Uh, but we we um, partnered uh, with Visier and some of the work that they did, some brilliant work that they did in looking at a very large data set of over 4 million you know, data points of um, what the proper team size or ideal team size would be for certain attributes like you know, team engagement and retention of individual employees. And you know, what they found was um, that functions all have different um, sort of averages, which makes sense. Like some functions and some uh, sectors, like healthcare and you know support services, have rather large teams. Operations rather large teams. Software development engineers and finance, um, surprisingly to me, have very very small teams. Um, and you can think about that as like heads down, deep concentration, work and speed. And what we so what we did was we partnered with them to say. That's great. And, and there, by the way, I, and you should go read this research, but the ideal team size for those attributes is somewhere between six and 10 people. Um, you know, you're, you feel like you belong to a team. You're more likely to stay, uh, you know, and you got better engagement. And so those are all really, really important. I, all, I would add to it based on our research, the velo your, your velocity is better. Uh, your ability to move with speed and agility is better with small, you know, at Amazon, we would call them two pizza teams. Um, and frankly, uh, there's great research out there that says that you could probably be more disruptive with small teams um, because you your ability to think big is, is much greater. But there's always a caveat. And the caveat is um, what small teams don't bring you is integration, stability, and risk mitigation. So, uh, so what we ended up doing was we partnered and looked at all of our data sets in, in conjunction with some of theirs and started to look at like, is there, is it really an ideal team or is this a form follows function question again? And should you start with what are we trying, trying to solve for? If it's engagement, small teams help. Um, not that you couldn't have engagement with the large teams, but it's just easier. Um, but if you're trying to drive stability, um, in, inside of an organization, larger teams actually help with that. And um, if you're working on precision and you know repetitive patterns like larger teams, bureaucracy, if some people want to even call it that, actually help to stabilize things. So so what we did, David, was we built this continuum that we call speed the speed stability continuum. Um, if you're aiming at stability, you know, start thinking about larger team sizes. Um, if you're aiming for speed, and the reality is like the ideal combination, um, and we're, we're doing some writing about this and we'll probably have a couple of things published soon. Um, the ideal combination, the ideal is to have a combination of both. Where do I need to work with velocity and speed? Those should be teams that are smaller on the edge. Where do I need to synchronize, um, all those activities and stabilize them so that I can launch, you know, if we're talking about product development or if I'm in manufacturing so that I can operate with ongoing precision. And the reality is you need both. Um, so it's the tension between those two things um, that, that really help an organization to constantly adapt and, and adjust, but also to execute and perform. And so that's the, that's the work that we've been doing. Um, and, we, and we've done some really cool work with some, uh, some teams that are trying to catch up on the AI frontier, some tech companies actually. And we looked at team size and what we found is either they have way too many small teams and they don't have the right stability synchronization structures in the center, um, or they're, they have teams, like we have one team, one organization where, and this is where the matrix actually really gets in the way because um, the matrix drives stability if you think about this. Uh, but we have one organization that couldn't figure out why they had all the assets to be a, a pioneer in AI, on the AI frontier, but they, on average, 60% of their employees belong to four or five different teams. So what ends up happening is that, that that creates this collaborative drag we were talking about before, and it slows things down 
And that's that's where you know this speed stability continuum um, is helping to unlock some of our thinking on this. So what I take from that is to you know in terms of people listening to this about thinking and maybe about their org design. Number one, this has quite a lot of implications for for org design. Um, two is think about the outcomes that you're trying to get to, uh, and then don't think about a team in isolation. Think about the organization, and as you said, that there are certain teams, maybe smaller teams, that you're looking to, to drive innovation and, and disruption, you're probably looking at a slightly smaller team there. But then, as you said, you might be looking for a team to implement some of those ideas and put them into practice. So you, you potentially could be looking at a bigger team there. I mean, I guess that leads to the kind of wider question, uh, Michael, is, is how do we use these insights? Uh, and, and then how do we measure the success um, of actually putting some of these into action and, and to outcomes. Yeah, I think um, I think you always start with what is the desired outcome. You know, so when when I think about these things, one of the one of the challenges I, I get really excited about what's happening with generative AI because I think it's going to unleash you know the possibilities with um, network analysis at a whole different level. But one of the challenges with network analysis in particular is the context matters, um, and you got to you always have to start with. Um, What's the outcome? Like, where where are we at today, and what are we trying to to drive? Uh, so we've we've actually uh, Greg and I uh, and Rob Cross um, have actually created this what we call context flywheel, which is and it's very consistent with all the people in Lytics work. Like, what's the desired outcome? Then you go look at what insights what insights do I need to find in order to better um, understand how do I achieve that outcome? Uh, and then there's this cycle of what it, once I have those insights and I've served them up, um, insights are cheap, right? We all have insights and opinions, but how do I then take action, appropriate action to close the gap on what we're trying to do and then start all over again? So this flywheel that really starts with insights, then drives actions, then you know produces some output and that output creates new insights. And thinking about that as a flywheel motion um, I think is really important for all people analytics um, and certainly important for network analytics. Um, and I'll, I'll give you like a real example of that, you know, so a, a whole lot of movement around, Hey, we got to flatten out organizations, you know? So, okay, that makes sense. We're, you know, we got some bureaucracy, maybe too many layers. Let's flatten out the organization. So you make those moves and you delayer and what ends up happening sometimes if you're not careful about it, is you, you start to generate insights that all I've done is really push the friction point or decision point to a different point inside the network. Um, and what I've really done is actually, in some cases, even slowed us down um, because now I've got you know 20 managers. If I just got rid of 20 managers, I've got 20 other managers or more who are bogged down and now have an access point um, challenge. And that you know if you put it in the flywheel and think, wait a minute, let's just gradually you know, take a, a layer or a few people out and see what happens with the, the insights. Do we speed up? Have we adversely affected collaboration? Have we, you know, increased? Like with that one, um, one of the things we've seen is uh, we, we were in an organization that wiped out 30% of middle managers. Um, and by doing that, all they did was create greater frustration, um, greater dissatisfaction, and they actually added co collaborative drag because they those the managers that remain ended up having to work two or three hours longer just to catch up on a daily basis, and you know, ultimately that turns into burnt. So putting that in this flywheel context, what happens is you can iterate your way through that without over swinging, which is you know oftentimes what's happening whenever we look at things statically. No, it's really good. I, mean, I think one of the one of the challenges that I've seen for organizations. Uh, with a with an organizational network analysis over the sort of I mean over maybe a decade, is they start with the tool. I want to do a I want to do an A. I think it's really cool. I've read one of Michael's papers or one of Rob's papers. I want to do an A and A, and then it's always like, well, for what? Um, and that's what you're saying. You know, think of the outcome first, and then apply the the relevant techniques and then collect the right data to actually help you answer that question. Though, <laughs> yeah, I. I completely agree with you. And I, I think when you got to stop looking at this as like arts and charts um, and start looking at this as a business lever. And I oftentimes get this question like, hey, can you come do an org analysis? I especially got this when I was internal. Can you come do an org analysis for us? Uh, we need to collaborate better. I'm like, how do you know? 
you need to collaborate better. Like, what, what does that look like? Um, what if you need to collaborate less? Um, because the reality is more is not always better when it comes to collaboration, as we've already talked about. Um, and what I find is like, uh, converse, when somebody presents the problem of, I got a communication challenge, I got a collaboration challenge, it's not nearly refined enough. It's our job as people analytic professionals to say, well, why do you think you have a collaboration challenge? Can we talk about that at another level? And it's really important because, um, especially if you're using, we haven't talked about active and passive o a yet, but especially if you're using survey-based active o a um, if you set up the instrument wrong, the survey incorrectly because you've asked the wrong questions, you're, you're not going to get to the level of output that you're expecting. And then you're going to go through this exercise, which happens a lot for people you know, entering into this field, is you, you haven't really gotten precise enough on what the desired outcomes are. You run a broad-based analysis. People look at it and say, that's really cool. Oh, I already knew that. Or we already, and then they don't take any action. And then what you've done as, as again, people analytic professionals is you've diminished your ability to enter back into that client's challenge in the future. So it's a serious credibility issue. Um, so, so I think we've got a lot of work to do on the contracting side, um, before we ever get started on this stuff. It's such a good point. I mean, we, we do at uh, Insight 222, we do quite a lot with HR leadership teams. Um, and HR business partners uh, in particular to help them get more comfortable using data. Um, and, it, I mean, and we always say it starts with asking the right questions and actually spend a lot of time drilling, as you said, for the, 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 the active um, O&A surveys, drilling down to what the right questions are. So if you are, ask the right questions, then you can start thinking, okay, what are the hypotheses that we might want to test? And then, okay, so what's the data we need to collect to answer those questions and test those hypotheses? It's so important to do it, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's... Well, and it's even, it's even more important when it comes to something like networks because um, there is no optimal network, right? There is more is not better. Uh, there is a sweet spot, as we've already exemplified with the speed stability matrix. And, um, you know, if you're not really clear on the front end, um, you start to think about, hey, I need more bridging connections or more, you know, I need better bonding. And the reality is that might not be true. And you you could actually create more havoc with your solutions um, if you're not precise with, you know, that those sets of questions on the front end. I think that leads quite nicely to the technology question. You, you mentioned that you're excited about what generative AI could, could do for networks. And obviously you mentioned briefly their passive um, ONA as well. Michael, you know, how does technology help facilitate the insights um, coming out of um, networks? And, and particularly, I guess, now that, as, as we've talked about, we're in the age of AI. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could probably spend the rest of our time together on this question. And I think we're only like I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of possibilities. So so if I'm being really honest with you, I'm still trying to figure this out, probably like you are and many of your listeners but what, what the thing that gets me really excited, David, is the conversation we were just having about you need to understand context. You need to understand what are you solving for? Um, you know, and AI, you know, the very first thing without being super repetitive is AI can help us to better understand certain things uh, from the very outset, especially when you we're using passive signal. Like I can catch you in the flow of work as an employee. I know what life cycle you are in your career stages. I know that you've been here. 90 days. And all of a sudden now I can, based on leveraging that through AI or looking at project uh, management, you know, technologies, you know, like some of the work that Asana does, we can look at like where you are in some different stage of the project. By catching that contextually, what we're then able to do is steer, you know, then catch the passive insights um, around the context. So I'm talking my flywheel again, right? So, um, and then drive the proper actions that close and drive the right the right output um, and then start over again. The problem with what we were just describing is if you're not asking all the right questions, um, you steer you can steer the client um, in, in the wrong direction. The reality is, um, you know, generative AI will help capture some of those insights, not all of them, but help us to capture some of those insights so we can steer you know our analysis in a in a much more direct way. So so it helps on the front end. Um, it certainly helps in aggregating and augmenting data sets. And uh, I mean, like right now, here we are in a podcast and you're going to click the button at the end of the podcast um, and it's probably going to transcribe this. Um, 
you know, or we're in a Zoom meeting and we hit the button and it synthesizes the agenda for us and we have five actions. Like those are all things we can never do before. So, so it's certainly augmenting collaboration, but I, where I get most excited, if you can't tell already, I'm excited about this, is on the um, personalization. You know, so now what we can do is I can steer specific um, network strategies directly to you. Um, and not only to you, but in context for you in relationship with the other people you're working with, like Jonathan or others. And, you know, so now we can say, David, um, you know, you, you've been heads down, you know, quite a bit um, in this. And, and it looks like the stage of work is you should be broker and out across. Um, you know, Jonathan's doing that. Um, maybe you should maybe you should set up a coffee with Jonathan. Like that's the new set of possibilities. And and it's out like that as weird as that sounds, it's it's done. Like it's so I, I can't code. Um, I can code very little. I was going to say a lick. That's not quite true. But but um, you would never uh, want me to code anything for you. But I can now, and uh, we can design these these sort of uh, outputs. You know, using generative AI and point you know personalized learning paths in academia. Um, we are literally disrupting the way we teach an MBA program by not just having a syllabus and learning objectives for the course, but by having learning objectives. We're, and we're trying, we're experimenting with this 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 semester by having learning objectives in a course for David, so that you can learn by working on projects and you know experiences. And the professor's job now is to give you feedback on that track, as opposed to trying to teach you the same way that. You know, 35 other individuals are being taught from the front of the classroom, which slows some down. Um, and, you know, blow, you know, and in other cases, others are just blown right by because you're teaching at the middle of the bell curve, not, you know, not actually personalizing, you know, for the whole bell curve. And that's, that's where we're able to go. Um, and I get, you know, from a talent management, which is the space, you know, I've hung my cap for years, uh, from a people development, from an education standpoint, I think generative AI and the things that we're talking about right now will be more disruptive um, than any place else. Very good. And I think that helps, you know, I think that helps us to the second part, uh, Michael, around the future of talent management with social capital. I think the technology element is clearly going to help us to get there. So I know this is something that you've been working on as well, helping organizations leverage insights from, from network analysis to enhance their talent management strategies. It, what, what approaches um, should they consider? Um, so I, I'll start by saying, like being someone who's, you know, spent their career in talent management, um, even though I've studied networks in the context of that, I would say that, and I'm probably going to insult somebody with this next sentence. Um, so I, I, um, I'll apologize in advance, but I'll just say get over it and argue, counter argue me offline if you think I'm wrong. There has been very little innovation um, frankly, in HR um, and certainly in talent management, with the one exception of perhaps people analytics and all the work that's happened you know, that you've spearheaded and many others have over the last decade. Um, but I would say that the broad based talent management frameworks and strategies have remained static. Um, part of the problem with that is, uh, and, and this is my hypothesis, this is where you could appropriately disagree with me, um, anyone, but um, Part of the problem is we've narrowed in on um, human capital strategies, and, and I'm all for human capital, like smart people uh, with great experiences make you know radical differences inside of organizations. But the problem is when you got a lot of really smart people together, and then frankly, in the future, whenever you're able to augment the bottom of that curve by bringing up you know people you know as newbies to the middle of that bell curve using AI, um, all of a sudden your ability to differentiate yourself in your career or your talent management strategies is nullified uh, because you got a bunch of really smart people around you. But social capital, I believe, is the great differentiator. Um, so human capital is kind of the bedrock of your ability, skills. But I, I believe that just based on the level of evolution, social capital is that multiplier. It creates that career multiplying effect. Uh, so, so one of the things that Greg Pryor and I are working on is this whole concept of how do we um, help to augment human capital with social capital in a talent management lens? Um, and to do that, you know, we we've been really collecting research. 
I, I would have hoped and I would have hoped to have gotten to this probably about three years ago, but this thing called hybrid work got in the way. Um, so so we've been able to like refocus. The good news is now we've got over five years of data across numerous companies um, from the Connected Commons. And you know what we're doing, David, is we're we're thinking about um, uh, modeling out social, modeling out your network across the life cycle of your career. And um, you know some of this work was uh, published and pioneered from the Amazon days. Rob Cross has done a lot of this work on what we call fast movers. Um, and what we know with fast movers, new people coming into the organization, um, generally speaking, it takes me or you, depending on what organization we're moving into and how strong culture it is, somewhere between two to three years to be at the optimal point of influencing inside that network. I, I want to say that again because it sometimes blows people's minds. It takes you about two to three years to find like the center of that network. But these fast movers can do that in about a third of the time. And, you know, so what we've been able to do is collect more and more data um, and we're able to then say, like, how do you replicate what these fast movers do? And fast movers, you know, um, you know, build relational energy, which you've heard me talk about energy already. Uh, you know, they create network pool, which is really important. So rather than coming in, sometimes the, the advice we give to new employees is go execute, like deliver on results, get results done. And that's actually good, good advice. We all have to deliver results, but it actually can get them marginalized pretty quickly if they aren't doing that within the context of the social system. Um, maybe a better way of thinking about this is how do I help you get results? Um, so if I'm a new person, how do I help David and, you know, um, you know, whoever else, Rob and, you know, whomever else um, increase their results? And to do that, like I, I've got to come in and fill in skill gaps or capability gaps to enable you. And what it does is it creates this network dynamic where if I've done that for five, six, seven people, what ends up happening is I build this reputation um, and all of a sudden more people start reaching out to me. And what it does is I start to draft off of other people's social capital and it pulls me into the center of the network sooner by creating more incoming connections. Um, and you know by doing the, those motions and you're sort of replicating those moves, you know, you're able to accelerate the velocity of moving in. Um, but here's, here's a caveat. You're not, you won't be surprised by this because I've been a broken record on this. That actually is good until you're in the center of the network. Now, all of a sudden, you're, uh, you're a hostage to your network if you haven't thought about how do I shift out of that. So the first stage is surge in. The second stage uh, from a talent management standpoint is shift out. And what I got to start doing right away, like maybe a, a year in, is start to think about like, how do I now get myself um, out of the center of the network so that I can broaden out um, and don't, you know, drain my network is now managing me versus me managing it. And what we've seen is that there are certain people, not everybody, that can shift out and recognize that I don't have to be connected to everybody because, you know, if I'm connected to you and you're connected to six other people, um, those six other people, I can I can leverage my relationship with you, um, and I can start to remove myself from redundant connections and start freeing up capacity uh, to reinvest in deep focus work, so that I can continue to deliver over the long haul. Because many people actually stop delivering because they get pulled into so many meetings, and this is a real coaching point because you know my ego feels good when people invite me into meetings, but the reality is my performance can sacrifice from that. Um, so you got to actually remove your, the great leaders we've worked with and interviewed, review their calendars on a, on a quarterly basis. And they ask themselves, am I getting enough leverage out of this um, ongoing standing calendar? Can I actually manage, you know, lev you know, decrease the inflow of work so that I can free up capacity? And, you know, Rob has done some tremendous work on collaborative overload where you can maybe free up as much as 18 to 24% of your capacity. And then, then you can start to think about the next move, which is how do I reinvest that more broadly? Um, and what we know is um, then is, you know, what we got to do is start thinking about scaling ourselves um, as, a, as a talent management move. Um, I'll stop in a moment because you can tell I can talk about this stuff all day. But, you know, then you scale, then you scale yourself um, and you need broad connections. So now I'm reaching out across the organization and what we know, and there's great research, some of this just came from University of Pennsylvania, is that um, 
you know, lateral moves actually create a vertical progression. And, you know, you are, you know, if you move over and start to think about how do I, um, how do I broaden out my network, you know, over the long haul, uh, you are 16% more uh, likely to be promoted and 20% more, I'll get that one, 20% more likely to be promoted and 16% more likely or make 16% more uh, compensation over the long haul. So this lateral move actually helps, you know, the vertical incline. Um, and, and you only do that through scaling yourself. Um, and, you know, I, and being very practical about this for a second, um, you're building connections at different influencing um, points. You're accessing broader information. And frankly, you're creating a, a more strategic mindset because, you know, I get to now see, um, you know, what other departments are working on or other groups are working on. And I'm able to actually create a more uh, relevant framework, you know, for the entire organization. So, you know, this scaling piece really is important. And then finally, um, you know, there's what we call fast risers. Uh, so fast movers, you know, fast shifters, fast scalers, and, you know, going horizontal and then fast risers, which ultimately get promoted sooner or faster. Um, and what they do is, first of all, though, that's a life cycle. Like those all fall in sync in some, some form or fashion. Um, it's not quite as linear as I may articulate it here, but the reality is fast risers mimic the network of the leader above them before they're actually promoted into that position. So rather than, you know, yes, your potential matters and we should assess that. Yes, your capabilities matter and performance track record, all that matters. But the reality is most people are promoted uh, because they've already started to operate at the level above themselves um, in the network. So I don't know what level you're working at, but if I compare your network footprint, um, you know, who are you interacting with? Who are the people you uh, relate with on a daily basis? If, and you're likely to be far more likely to be promoted in the next six months if it mimics the level above you. And again, I don't know that that's overly profound, but the profound part is we've been able to track that, analyze it uh, now, and then even generalize it across a multitude of different organizations. And now what we're working on are what, what are those like moves? Now I'm getting to the practice side. Um, the insights are useless unless you can actually take action. And what we're trying to do is uh, codify the network science over the years to plug in network moves like you could if you're trying to build local trust, use the fast friends protocol, or if you're trying to influence vertically, you know, apply the three percent influence rule, which is I want to find my page rank people and who are those high influencers because I can actually leverage their network to get stuff done. Um, so uh, again, you can tell I'm pretty excited about this, but we we believe that this you know this along with the uh, context of AI um, to be able to actually usher in these moves in the flow of work has the potential of radically reinventing at least parts of talent management. And also from an individual perspective, I mean, A, what you've just um, walked us through there, Michael, is number one, you know, be as intentional about managing your network as you are about managing your your skills, your, your performance and, and everything else. And there's kind of a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between the two. And then, as you said there, the technology, I mean, we can envisage a time where maybe we've got a, a, an AI coach giving us, you know, as an individual, giving you advice about your network, you know, and, and, and where you should focus, uh, focus. So again, if you've managed to get yourself in the center of the network, as you said, maybe pulling back a little bit, um, it's 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 really fast. It's quite fascinating. Obviously, you've done the research over five years, and you, you're seeing some of the the insights coming out. But you you think how that will develop, um, you know. And our next question will be how we can use that from an HR and business um, leader perspective. But from an individual perspective, that could be really powerful in helping you manage your career. Yeah. Well, I mean, oftentimes, I, like I'll tell you one illustration of that, David. So career stalls. Um, career stalls are almost always a network problem. Now, now, again, I'm presuming that you're capable and you were hired in and your hiring systems and all that stuff are great. Like somebody picked you for a reason. And certainly there are times where skill sets get an issue. So I don't want to overly generalize. But I would say that in 90 percent of the conversations we have, a career stall has has to do more with your network configuration 
and what you have or haven't delivered. Um, and, and generally what that means is you've gotten bogged down into one phase. You know, more is, when it comes to connections, more is not always better. Um, and, you know, you've got to get very intentional again about the form follows function uh, framework only at the individual level. Um, and what we also see is with fast levers, uh, which I hadn't talked about, this works in the inverse as well. Fast levers are usually those people that never get that network surge. Um, they never figure out how to create the network pool. They get themselves marginalized early by trying to be the hero too soon. Um, and then they get pushed out to the edge. Um, and then they, you know, we start to describe them as an organizational fit issue. Uh, but what it really is, is they haven't leveraged um, the right network moves um, to, to get themselves pulled in. So they either quit on their own or ultimately you know, are, are uh, let go because they've been marginalized and they sit on the edge of the network. That's fascinating. It's going to be fascinating how this progresses over the next few years. So thinking about what, what you've just walked through, Michael, how can an HR or business leader leverage some of these insights to enable employee success? And, you know, maybe what are some of the practical steps that they, they can take to implement these insights? Yeah, and I, I think both with the, you know, sort of the... Um, uh, advancements in AI, but also, also I think with just our um, understanding of the insights, um, I, I think what I think our next job is to make this super accessible and um, easy to step in. Like I, I can, I, I'm not showing them here, but I can get up in front. You've seen them, David, and we certainly did it at the retreat last year, where we show lots of uh, network diagrams. And you know what we can do is we can overwhelm you know the average leader. Um, and or um, HR manager by you know showing all the statistics and dazzling them and that, but making it inaccessible. And the reality is, um, we just we just need to know that we're in a different stage and we need to ask different questions. So, like one of the things that a fast shifter does is they first start to monitor the intake of their their calendar. Every, we can all go do that tomorrow. Like we can all look at it and say like. Are the people I'm meeting with on a weekly basis, the people that are actually going to help me broaden out, broaden out my mindset because I got to get to the fast scalar move? I mean, the answer, if the answer is no, then you got to re, you know, it's just simple uh, personal time management. You got to, you got to actually help somebody. So an HR professional can help leaders and great HR leaders do this already, help leaders coach themselves around their calendar. And are they really creating a multiplying effect? Are they, are they scaling themselves one on many, or are they still operating in a one on one mindset? Um, and then you got to balance that with, you know, you've got to be empathetic as a leader and you don't want to be distant, you know, so you got to think about all those things. But a, a great HR uh, business partner is already doing these things. All we're trying to do is inform them with science um, and then ultimately provide them with here are the five or six high leverage moves um then anyone can go use even absent the you know the analysis inside of your own organization and i'll give you like a real example of that um you know page rank people so um again i'll get scientific for a moment page rank people are your people that are uh connected to other important people so you know David, I know this about your network already, like you're super connected to other influential people. So if I can get myself connected to three other high influencers, I can, I can minimize the amount of effort I have to expend and I can optimize, you know, my overall network footprint because I've just connected myself to, it's called the 3% influencing role. I'm able to actually now reach 90, 85 to 90% of the network through you know five or six key um, high paid rank influencers, um, and if you do that, like now all of a sudden I, that works in both directions. Like I can I can actually create incoming ties, but I can also scale new ideas more um, broadly by tapping into that. And, I, and to do that, all I have to do is ask a simple question. Um, I could ask you or anyone I'm talking to, who are the highest influence people you know. And they're going to give me three names. And then I go ask that question again, and they give me three more names. And then I do that 10 times. And then I look at who are the three names most repeated, and boom. I just did a network analysis in the everyday conversation. And now all of a sudden, I can go um, partner with those three, four, or five people and amplify my ability to scale myself. Well, Michael, I always learn a lot speaking to you. I mean, the, the whole topic of networks, I think, is, is fascinating. Um, and, you know, as you, as you, as we've talked about today, you know, the research that you're doing, the advances in technology, 
I mean, I think we're going to see this propel forward even more in the, in, in the next few years. So we've got one question now, which is the question we're asking everyone on this series. And then I'm going to ask you as well how people can keep in touch with, with you, find out what, more about what you're doing. So this is, a, as I said, the question of the series. Um, you know, and I think this is uh, hopefully a nice, easy one for you, Michael. Um, and you can maybe use network data around this as well. So how, how can organizations use workforce data to help drive culture, inclusion and engagement? Um, I, yeah, I can't, you, you know me, David, I have to answer with a network response. Um, you know, I, I, I think again, um, I, first of all, very critically important things these days. Um, I'll start with inclusion and then work backwards to culture. Um, I mean, I, I love the, you know, the DNI work that we're doing across, you know, the world and, you know, certainly representation is essential. Like that's a starting point. Um, but I think far too often we haven't thought about like, what does, what does inclusion really mean? Well, it means I'm at the optimal point of influence. You know, so um, I want diversity at the core of my network. Um, then I know that, you know, sometimes we describe that as a seat at the table. And, you know, what I really want is diverse folks at the center of the network um, or in certain bridge connections uh, in order to better influence. And I think, you know, so when I was at Amazon, one of the things I loved that AWS did was they flipped the I and the D by saying I and D. Um, so that you're driving towards inclusion, otherwise you're just creating a revolving door approach. Um, so, so I think that's that's certainly a network challenge. And culture is far more nuanced. So I won't I, I won't go deep into this, other than to say uh, we've done some pretty significant research on this as well. And um, certain behaviors, uh, certain you know values are caught, and other values are taught. Um, we like to think that we can teach all of culture. Uh, but the reality is some things need to be modeled. It's, it's tacit knowledge. It's implicit. It's very hard to describe. Um, and the best way to do that is also, in my mind, a network challenge. Like, you know, if you're in a small, tight, cohesive pocket, you can, I can absorb and you can model behaviors and I can absorb those. And there's this like catching, you know, contagion effect of those desired behaviors. And that's why leaders are so essential in modeling culture. So, so those are the things that come up for me um, as, as we think about, you know, inclusion and culture and, um, you know, engagement. Clearly, you know, the, the more you are in relationship with other people, the more likely you're going to be in positive, high relationship with them. And, um, you know, so certainly there are network, channel, network opportunities there. And that's a great use case, isn't it, for network analysis inclusion? Because, you know, obviously you can ask a lot of survey questions related to inclusion, whether... You know, diverse group, diverse individuals, diverse groups feel included within the. They feel included, but then you can actually study the network and look at the composition of the network, and then you can start to understand who are the leaders that are actually inclusive and who are the leaders that are maybe less inclusive. So it you, it, it can really shine a light on 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 what it what's really happening. Can't it? For sure, for sure. Well, Michael. Thank you so much for, for joining me again. Um, it's, as I said, it's always an absolute pleasure. Before we, before we um, end for the day, can you let listeners um, know how they can stay in touch with you on social media, find, follow more about your great work, and please tell them about the social capital compendium that you're publishing every month on, on LinkedIn as well? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, LinkedIn's probably the easiest place just because that's where you know, most of the work is, is synthesized. Um, we do this uh, monthly. I try to do it monthly. Uh, compendium where we're trying to really just, I mean, I, well, I'm jazzed up about all the people starting to work in this space and try to elevate all the great insights from others. Um, and then, you know, I publish in places like um, HR Exchange and, you know, Process Improvement, um, on, kind of on a monthly basis, you know, some of the research. So those are all great places. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn and Connect the Commons are kind of like the two uh, central sites. Well, Michael, Thank you so much for being a guest on the Digital HR Leaders podcast again. I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person at some point um, in the in the next few months. Um, I know I've got a, a number of trips to the US um, coming up. So, um, yeah. And, and Michael, thank you so much for sharing your, your time and expertise with listeners. Super appreciate it, David. And thank you for all that you've done for the field. Um, it's just been remarkable, you know, being on this journey of the last 10 plus years of what's happened with, you know, people science as a whole. Um, and, and you've certainly been the core catalyst for that. So thank you. Yeah, that's very kind. Thank you very much, Michael. I'll end it on that very high note. So thank you very much. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven digital HR agenda. 
Make sure that you subscribe via your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.